This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. For those of you who are registered for 301, um, you recall that one week from today, that is Wednesday, we will not have the normal energy seminar. And the reason why is because mm. next week is an event packed week for energy interested people. And for that reason, I'll draw your attention to two events, one on Monday and one on Tuesday. Those of you who are registered for 301 can attend either or both and sign the sign up sheet on either one. Either one can count for and 301 seminar, or both. Okay, the first one on Monday is the GSET five-year anniversary event, which is a, in the form of a small symposium. It's from, am I right? From 3.30 to 5.30, and it will be in the Hewlett Teaching Center, just across the way here in room 200. I'll pass this around today also. The second event, which is on Tuesday, is the, um, what, little paper words. Is the um, Sustainable Places Conference. And anybody who's on our mailing list, you've gotten us already by email. And if you're not, you can sign up on the um, mailing list that goes around the Energy Services Plus sign in sheet as well. And we'll send you the information so you know who all the speakers are and what time is in the um, So, this one, there are two se separate panels. One is on the business of sustainability with several representatives from Stanford, IBM, and Yahoo, who serve as sustainability gurus for their organizations. And the second is um, sort of state and municipal leadership, um, where we have um, Mary Nichols, who's the chairman of CARB, that is implementing uh, AB 32 here in California, among other things. Diane Greenwich, who's California Public Utilities Commission, and, and Mayor Gavin Newsom, um, along with Larry Goulder, and also Jim Sweeney from the first panel. So there's lots of good things. Um, they're in that order, so if you have classes, you need to come part-time, that's okay too. Uh, there is a break between the two panels. So we'll send all that information around, and I'd like to introduce Carrie Armel, who's gonna talk with us about one of the really challenging areas in energy, and that's cracking the behavioral nut. Um, Carrie works uh, for the Freeport Center for Energy Efficiency here, as well as over at the Medi Medical School for the Center for uh, Preventative Research. The, center, the Stanford Preventive Research Center. And um, Carrie has put together on the Freeport site um, a whole section on behavior as it relates to energy efficiency and climate change, which you might find interesting as well. Thanks, Sue. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Thanks for coming. Um, I just want to say a few words about Preport for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Preport Institute was started about a year and a half ago with a $30 million endowment from Jay Preport, a Stanford alum. And the institute focuses on six different areas, um, systems, buildings, transportation, policy modeling, and behavior is one of those six areas. So today I'm going to give you an overview of the behavioral area. And at the end, if you're interested, we could talk a little bit more about what's going on here at Stanford. So to give you a little bit of background as a motivator for why behavior is becoming important, I'm gonna share with you the current political climate. I'm sure most of you know about AB 32, which has really um, aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals. So by 2020, um, 1990 levels need to be achieved, which is 30% reductions compared to the business as usual forecast. And by 2050, it's 80% below the 1990 levels. Um, at the national level, I don't know a whole lot about what's going on other than talking to the Department of Energy, and they also have significant reductions targets. Now, both at the California level and at DOE, they're interested in behavior. So this past fall, I was co-chair of the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference, which was the first of its kind. We held it in Sacramento. It sold out a month beforehand at about 500 people. And we had top policymakers there. So you can see uh, just a few from the list, the head of California Energy Commission, the head of uh, California Public <coughs> Utilities Commission, et cetera. And just this past week, I was at a behavior workshop at the Department of Energy. So why are organizations starting to become interested in behavior? Well, policymakers want sizable reductions soon. 
um, making reductions sooner rather than later results in larger reductions than would otherwise be the case because they accumulate over more time. Um, and advanced technology is likely to take several decades for development and diffusion. The policymakers also want to make the reductions in the most cost-effective way as possible. Some of you might be familiar with a report that came out recently, well, not so recently now, probably about a year ago now, um, by McKenzie and Company, showing that um, reductions in the residential and small commercial sector can result in the um, cheapest savings and very sizable savings. So on the y-axis, we have um, cost. I, I think it might be marginal cost. And then on the x-axis, we have potential in, um, uh, in uh, gigatons per year of reduction in CO2. And so the width of the, each bar it indicates the potential um, reductions in gigatons. And on the left-hand side, the, the um, downward slope indicates um, negative cost, so in other words, savings. And most of those initiatives are residential and small commercial initiatives. Um, let's see, in addition, uh, the residential sector and the uh, small commercial sector have typically been difficult to address using traditional methods. So, for example, it's unclear how carbon taxes and cap and trade would drive the residential sector. So, in short, uh, there's a lot of interest in what the uh, behavioral sciences can add to engineering and economics approaches. And the rest of my talk is going to cover some of these techniques. So I'm going to start with some typical approaches. When I talk to people, they tend to have some conceptions of what is effective in motivating behavior change, but unfortunately some of these approaches aren't as effective as we would hope. Um, the first one is monetary incentives and disincentives. These can be successful, but they often have disappointing results. So for example, in the chart on the right-hand side, um, this represents a, a review of utility-sponsored incentive programs to promote home retrofits. And this bar in the middle, this, this bar over here, is the um, most, the programs with the largest financial incentives. So they offered 93% rebates on retrofits to the homes. And this dashed line is the average percent of people that actually made the retrofits to the homes given these financial incentives. So it's about 5%. And the um, endpoints represent the um, full range of the seven utilities that use these 90% rebates. And the um, range is attributed to differences in the programs other than financial incentives that were used. Another technique that people commonly think should be employed is attitudes. Unfortunately, um, meta-reviews as early as the 1960s have shown that correlations between attitudes and behavior are very small, um, between 0 and 0.3, so um, not very effective at all. Uh, a third approach is using standard marketing techniques. Um, Unfortunately, these techniques tend to focus on small shifts in market share for behaviors that people are typically already engaging in, like drinking coffee. They also tend to encourage indulgence and not restraint. Um, in contrast with energy efficiency, we want um, large portions of the population to make significant behavior changes um, or to shift to new behaviors that they're not necessarily engaging in. So it's somewhat of a different challenge. Um, and all of these approaches definitely have things to offer, but I think they're going to be insufficient in really creating the changes that we need. So what should we do? For at least several decades, the field of public health has put an exerted effort into changing behavior in order to address problems like smoking and heart disease. The fields employ interventions at multiple levels. Um, I'll illustrate some of these with examples related to climate change. So at the top we have policy interventions. Um, by this I mean, in this context I mean formal rules. Um, so these might be instituted by the government, by utility companies, um, et cetera. Then there's interventions at the level of the physical environment. And that can be broken up into the built environment. So that would be characteristics like whether a city is walkable. 
Um, there's buildings, um, how user friendly they are, technology, which would include things like whether programmable thermostats are intuitive so that people actually use them. Then there's the socio-cultural level, and that refers to things like media um, communication, so serial dramas, public service announcements through TV, newspaper, et cetera. Um, there's the interpersonal level, and that includes face-to-face -face contacts of programs with schools, local businesses, Girl Scout troops, YMCAs, et cetera. At the individual level, there's not really any interventions. It requires that people do a lot of research on their own and make these changes in their own lives. And I'm not going to cover that because I think it's incredibly effortful and we can't reasonably expect the majority of people to do that. I think we have to focus on other types of interventions. Um, just a couple of other notes. There's interactions between these levels. Um, so a new technology could facilitate changes in policy or um, marketing initiatives. Uh, there's also um, an understanding in public health that complementary interventions at multiple levels tend to be most effective. So if you change the built environment, but you don't do marketing or you don't um, have walking clubs, et cetera, then uh, it, you're not going to realize the full potential of that change. So I'm going to cover each of those in more detail with examples, but I want to cover just a few more points before doing that. There are things that should be done before beginning interventions. So first, we need to pick some specific target behaviors, not just raise general awareness. To do this, we should evaluate the size of the CO2 footprint um, in order to get the biggest bang for our buck. But we also need to take into account the malleability, so how easily <coughs> this behavior will be to change. There's um, backcasting approaches that can be used. This term has different meanings in different disciplines, but here I'm using it to mean um, choosing an endpoint um, of goals and then working backwards about how to get there. And then we need measurement techniques to evaluate the efficacy of programs so that we don't keep recreating the wheel or spending a lot of money on programs that don't really work, but rather we're evaluating them and improving them over time, developing best practices, best programs, diffusing those. Um, and there's different ways of measuring. There's um, survey approaches that are coming out soon, um, technology to objectively measure energy use. And then it's also important to have guiding frameworks informed by theoretical and empirical knowledge about what works. And I'm going to give just a really super simple one um, right now. There's many theories of behavior change, um, but the majority of them have some core elements in common. And this is an extremely oversimplified version, but the basic gist is that motivation causes behavior um, which then facilitates an outcome in the form of either a reward or punishment, which then influences motivational levels in the future. There's antecedents, which are factors which initiate, um, which initially influence motivation. They might include things like addressing barriers or using technologies to facilitate um, motivation, so things like information and persuasion. I don't think these are the best um, techniques, but I just listed them because they might be ones you're more familiar with. And then there's consequence that are rewards and punishment um, that occur from receiving the outcome. They can be external, like money or social approval, or internal, like self-satisfaction or concern for future generations. And you'll see these um, appear in the rest of the talk. OK, so let's move on to some policy interventions. <clears throat> so there's. A uh, couple, and, and throughout the talk, I'm really just going to give one or two examples of each just so you can get a feeling for what types of things are out there. Um, these are a couple of examples that uh, would apply in the case of utilities policies. And they take advantage of cognitive disposition. So I'd put these under the category of antecedents that motivate behavior change, which I talked about uh, a couple slides back. So one is using opt-out versus opt-in policies. People tend to have a lot of inertia when it comes to decision making. Um, this has been shown to be true in the case of organ donations, 401k retirement plans, insurance choices, et cetera. So for example, in organ donation, we see that countries that have 
um, opt-in programs where you have to specify that you want your organs donated if you die, um, get uh, involvement rates of about 20%, whereas in countries where it's the default option, participation rates are about 80 to 90%. So I recently came across uh, an in-press article on um, a report of some real-world cases in Germany where they've tried employing opt-out techniques in to green electricity, and um, they got very high participation rates, about 94%, compared to surrounding areas of around 1%. Another example is the use of a loss aversion frame. There's a case in Alaska where utility companies installed meters in homes where people swipe their credit cards and it visually showed deductions. Um, I believe that was the scenario they used of, um, from their credit card as they used electricity. And um, my recollection is they got about 15% reductions and some people reduced electricity use as much as 30% because people have loss aversion. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the physical environment, starting with built, the built environment. So in the US, um, uh, biking and walking, um, uh, let's see, the proportion of trips in urban areas made by walking or biking in the US is about 7%, whereas in a lot of other European countries, the figure is closer to 30 to 45%. And if you want another stat that takes into account public transit, in 1990, the most common percent of trips made by car in the US was 84%, whereas the average in these other developed countries was less than 50%. So there's a bunch of model cities, there's a little bit of literature on this that um, documents what they do to encourage such a high participation rates in biking, walking, and also public transit. I'm gonna focus on biking here in the case, the model city of Munster, Germany. Um, so in Munster, they use, as in the other cases, they use infrastructure changes like special um, bike <coughs> lanes and promenades. They have special rules for cars on all residential streets to give priority to bikes. Ordinances requiring the inclusion of park biking facilities. Uh, they have a lot of safety requirements. Um, cycling education is given in school starting in kindergarten by police. Um, mobile repair service comes to customers with replacement parts to broken down bikes on the road. Um, then they use promotion, um, billboards, postcards, virtual tours on the web, etc. So um, the focus of this section obviously is on infrastructure, but this also makes the point that of the multiple complementary levels of interventions. There's, um, I should mention that there's also some work being done currently in US cities on walking behaviors. That's really <coughs> great work. Um, this example also raises another important issue, which is co-benefits. Um, if we can show co-benefits to interventions um, that address energy efficiency, uh, it raises the possibility of getting additional funds um, and more public support behind it. So the, the um, unmarked lines, really steep lines, indicate changes in obesity um, from 1950 to 1990. And um, the graph's a little bit um, odd in the sense that the changes are um, the percent people obese um, uh, as a percent of the mean of all other time points. But to give you another perhaps more concrete figure, if you look from 1990 to 2000, obesity rates have increased from approximately 10% to approximately 20%. So it's a huge increase. The, interestingly, these graphs are suggestive of something else, which is that the rise in obesity might be due to inactivity rather than to gluttony. So in the graph on the left, it shows patterns of um, energy take and fat intake, which tend to not follow the obesity curve, but in the path, the graph on the right shows <coughs> cars per household and television viewing hours per week, which do tend to um, follow that pattern more closely. Um, in addition, there's other co-benefits like addressing heart disease, asthma, et cetera. Okay, so technology. Uh, 
Um, according to a 2004 report um, cited in Energy Star's programmable thermostat stakeholders, meaning only about 20% of Americans own programmable <coughs> thermostats, and of those, 70% admit to not using them because they're too complicated. Now, I should qualify that I've been doing more research on this recently, and I think those figures in Energy Star were um, are fairly outdated because the re results recently are nowhere near as dramatic, but the, my point still holds, so it doesn't really matter. Um, the problem is that these devices tend to be designed from the engineer's perspective. Um, so they give users manuals that are pages long, that nobody reads, um, that require, that have arbitrary sequences of um, symbols. Um, instead, the items really need to be designed from the user's perspective of what's easiest to use. So in the second example, the Honeywell thermostat, <coughs> the interface is much more user-friendly, asking questions and allowing for simple responses. The difficulty is that um, it requires a fair amount of um, understanding to design the technology so that they're easy to use. It's not terribly expensive compared to the cost of engineering, but it still requires knowledge and um, study of it. So some of these um, areas of study include learnability, how easy a system is to learn, usability, how easy it is to use, um, motivation, which includes identity, signaling, aesthetics, <coughs> etc. cetera. Um, I was going to give a concrete example so you could get a feeling through the Prius energy monitor, but I think I'm actually going to skip over it in the interest of time. Basically, the point is that, um, that this is a learning curve, and anywhere along the cur learning curve, the learning curve is divided into a bunch of steps that the, learn the person goes through to learn and use the system. And um, you need to understand the different steps and facilitate them rather than impeding them. Um, and so that can include accommodating valid <coughs> rationality, in other words, limitations of attention and memory and decision making. Um, providing feedback, motivating and engaging the user. And to expand a little bit on feedback, which the energy monitor does very nicely, um, there's, there's actually um, trends where people uh, are online comparing their miles per gallon and competing against other people. And some people report achieving over 100 miles per gallon with their Priuses. Um, but I'm going to talk, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the feedback. In the domain of electricity use, there's been about 40 studies between 1975 and 2000 showing that um, 10 to 14 percent reductions in energy use are commonly achievable simply by having a household um, electricity meter inside your house so that you can see it frequently. And the second point is that as the feedback gets more specific, so the temporal resolution is greater and also um, uh, you get information on specific appliances, et cetera, people are able to get greater reductions in energy use. And there's some exciting work being done in this area that I think could um, greatly uh, enhance the number of people who have such specific feedback that if people are interested, I can talk to them about it later. So we talked in the domain of technology about improving design by ensuring proper use, by um, increasing <coughs> uptake, by providing feedback. And then there's a third thing that behavior can do related to technology, which is to create new niche devices. So with people having very variable schedules and wanting to come into a warm house and not have to program it ahead of time, having remote control thermostats that you can just call for your phone to on your way home to turn on your thermostat can allow uh, much larger reductions in your thermostat temperature during the day, which right now the average is only five and a half degrees setbacks. Smart power strips, dryer balls to speed drying and signal when drying is done, etc. Okay, so moving on to the sociocultural or media, there's a huge um, academic literature relevant to communication and ads in the fields of communication, consumer behavior, psychology, public health. And this applies um, to the design and deployment of public service announcements. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this literature. Persuasion models articulate a series of stages that individuals must go through before they'll perform a desired action. And if failure occurs at any stage, then the desired behavior does not occur. So it, it resembles actually the use of technology in a way. 
So I'll describe a simplified model. Uh, first, it's important that the user attends to the item, that they to the message, that they understand it, that they believe it, that they remember it at the appropriate time, which can be enhanced with prompts, um, and then that they decide to act accordingly. So although this might seem obvious, there's actually many points along the path that could produce failure um, in many tools in the social sciences that can enhance success. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them often aren't employed in message design. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples that might be particularly relevant in the case of, um, of uh, climate change. So one is the use of a messenger. Here we have um, some interesting messengers from uh, cigarette companies. Um, there was some work done by Alliance for Climate Protection, which is Al Gore's marketing group, showing that, um, that uh, Oprah Winfrey and <coughs> Bill Gates were considered two um, credible messengers, um, more credible than climate scientists. I mean, than scientists in general. It wasn't in the domain of climate. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> Let's see, there's framing approaches. Um, so messages could be framed that, um, you know, if you change, that it will be good for your personal welfare or for ethics or for economics and different segments of the population might be responsive to different frames. There's norms. Um, there's more than 30 years of research on norms showing that they're a lot more effective than people think. Um, uh, so mm -hmm. for example, um, there was, uh, an energy efficiency study showing that um, messages framed in terms of what your neighbors were doing were more effective in getting people to reduce their energy use than um, giving them economic information about their savings or giving them information about the environmental impact of those changes. And interestingly, if you ask people what they think, they, um, they think that norms would be the least effective in changing their own behavior. Um, but a word of caution, norms can backfire. So if you de depict how little, um, how few people do a behavior, it can actually have a rebound effect and cause people to become worse than baseline. Um, the, the last example has to do with mental models. Um, oftentimes we make um, assumptions about how people think about um, issues like environmental issues. And um, we could be way off. So in this case, the mental model on the upper, depicted in the upper left, represents uh, the fragility of the environment. So the, the, the ball, which is, symbolizes the environment, could be easily um, moved around and forced into a, a different state, disrupted, um, whereas the diagram on the upper right shows a relatively stable environment, not easily um, disrupted. Okay, so then, um, another area that could be useful is addressing habits and myths. So studies of nearly identical housing units have reported large two to three hundred percent variations in energy use. Um, and although some of it, this is due to differences in family size, etc., um, a lot of it is due to differences, um, ethnic as well as uh, local cultural differences and personal habits. So in a 1996 study that explored cultural differences more deeply, it was found that people in Norway and Japan differed on a variety of energy-related behaviors. For example, Norwegians washed their clothes at 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, while the Japanese washed their clothes in cold water. And this was due to the fact that Japanese did not associate hot water with <coughs> cleanliness. Um, let's see, myths and misunderstandings also result in wasteful behavior. For example, a common belief is that turning things off and back on again uses um, more energy than just leaving them on, whereas that's true, but just for such a small amount of time that it, it's not, um, practically that's not useful. So for your car, if you've been idling for more than 10 seconds, you should turn it off. Um, okay, but in message-dense environments, people um, often don't pay attention to these explicit ads that are being targeted to people. So there's some other alternatives that can be used that tend to be pretty effective. Um, one of them is implicit marketing techniques. So I'm sure you've all, you're all familiar with product placement. Um, something else that's done is changing the amount of product that people see in the store. So um, sometimes a lot 
um, more of a product <coughs> is displayed than demand calls for, so that people think it's demanded by um, consumers, and it sets a norm. Another example is buzz or viral marketing. Um, when this when individuals are paid to promote something without the receivers knowing um, this. So cigarette and alcohol companies have used this, for example, by having attractive women hang out in bars with a pack of cigarettes in their clear pocketbook so that other people can see this. There's um, the last sociocultural um, tool that I'm going to go over is in the domain of education entertainment, which has been really powerful, uh, particularly in third world countries. So there's a, um, a subgenre of this called serial dramas that are basically like US soap operas, except they promote pro-social behavior change. So some examples of their success include in Mexico, where the serial dramas began, um, one drama on literacy urged viewers to get their reading materials at the Capitol's distribution center. Fully 25,000 viewers showed up to get their reading materials the day after they were urged to do so. Another example from 1977 to 1986, when the Televisa family planning soap operas were on the air, the country underwent a 34% decline in its population growth rate, causing USAID and Mexico to write, these soap operas have made the single most powerful contribution to the Mexican population success story. Um, and, and I'm sorry that I didn't bring figures today because I actually do have some graphs. I just, I meant to scan them and I forgot to do that before I came. Um, so today the serial dramas have been adapted in over 25 countries and issues ranging, ranging from domestic violence, to personal hygiene, to HIV prevention. Um, there's, there really have, has not been much work done on environmental issues. Um, so they could potentially be adapted to um, environmental issues. So just briefly how they work. Humans love stories, so about um, two-thirds of the shows are entertainment to keep people engaged over long periods of time. Um, uh, sec the, the main um, behavior change approach involves modeling. So um, modeling relates to individuals <coughs> observing change in other people. So the shows are able to instruct these models or actors real life resources to them. They can create norms, and these aren't necessarily norms that are represented in the real world, but they can bias people's perceptions of norms. They build self-confidence by illustrating how people can address barriers. And they demonstrate expected outcomes. So they, they, the core of the work has um, the, the fact that there's, there are positive characters, negative characters, and transitional characters. And the positive characters are characters that illustrate the pro-social behavior change um, throughout the show and how good things come to them. And the transitional character, the negative ones are the opposite. And the transitional characters are individuals who start like the um, audience, and over time they transition to the good behaviors. Okay, so moving on to interpersonal. Um, this mostly involves face-to-face -face contact from friends, block leaders, etc. Um, the probably the most successful environmental example is the Hood Ri River Weatherizing Project undertaken by NRDC and the Pacific Northwest largest electricity suppliers. Initially, less than 10% of cu customers signed up for the voluntary program. However, when the project switched to relying heavily on local residents, such as citizen advisory councils and speakers at schools and churches, 85% of the households had, had uh, enrolled in two years and 95% by the end of the intervention. Um, lots of other organizations have caught on to this technique. Uh, Australia has an energy mark program based on their successful water mark program where they go around to houses and identify barriers and share these, uh, share ways of overcoming barriers with other people, et cetera. Um, it's quite sizable. They go to thousands of citizens and have hundreds of individuals going around. Um, Gore's Thousand Soldiers, an interfaith power and later religious group, has worked on similar principles. Um, there's, exam there's advantages to this technique over the other techniques, um, although disadvantages as well. In addition to the face-to-face -face contact, the personal messages, the norms of close others, um, you can get increased specificity of the intervention. So by, um, because 
um, the messengers know a little bit more about the audience, they can adjust their message. And then there's enhanced <coughs> learning that comes from direct experience. And this can be with um, direct experience with costs and benefits, which um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over, even though it's a fun example. Um, and then there's um, goal setting that can be done, feedback, addressing barriers, skills, just, just having people engaged in behaviors um, makes them more likely to follow through in the future, just the familiarity effect. And then there's additional tools like group feedback and competitions. Um, so um, in the case of uh, climate change, uh, oftentimes individuals feel like there's not much that they can individually do, but if you can aggregate feedback to individuals, uh, it can become empowering because people really feel like together they are making a difference. Um, as an example of energy efficiency in the um, in one area of Texas, the daily evening um, news provided feedback and conservation tips, and the community reduced gas usage by 32%, and the usage remained at 15% lower several months after the program. Um, the second example, there's um, a company. Um, uh, they, the, they have a campus resource monitoring system, I'm blanking on the name of the company, but basically they have competition going between the dorms and, the, and um, communal feedback for each dorm, and they've been pretty successful. There's also diffusion. Oh, so this is just a summary, so I went over policy, physical environment, sociocultural, interpersonal levels of interventions. The, there's interactions between these different levels. Complementary interventions tend to, have to be much more effective, and um, we can also address co-benefits of these interventions. But one element that I left out of all of this was diffusion. So there's a lot of work on diffusion that hasn't been translated into the applied arena yet. Um, there's work in sociology, in applied mathematics, in cognitive science, in um, consumer behavior. and. There's um, different aspects of diffusion that would be relevant uh, to facilitating um, change in uh, technology uptake and conservation behaviors. So there's characteristics of people. Um, we know that at around 10% diffusion that um, the diffusion takes off. So the trick is getting to 10%. And we know um, in other areas the types of people that lead up to the 10% and those people can be targeted to facilitate that change. We don't really know much about that in the area of energy efficiency. Um, the second aspect of diffusion is characteristics of networks. So the nodes, the circles are nodes, they represent people, and the lines represent communication channels between the people. Um, there's different types of networks. The bottom example on the left, um, the red circle represents a Girl Scout troop, and each Girl Scout contacts multiple families, etc. It ends up that, um, that the Girl Scouts sell, don't contact, but they sell 40% of US households. So if they just tagged on, in addition to their cookies, a sheet of energy efficient items, and you could deliver them to the households, they'd get pretty fast diffusion. Um, the third characteristic is characteristics of innovation. This has been studied for a long time. Um, this is Everett Rogers stuff, and there's several characteristics, and um, we can take advantage of those to expedite diffusion. Um, the last thing to, about diffusion is that there's, in the modeling literature, there's some interesting counterintuitive findings that have been tested in real world settings that haven't, also haven't been translated to um, applied situations. So just sort of as an overview, I went over a lot of different fields today, but this is just a representation of some of them um, and how they overlap in different ways, but I think um, there's a lot to be learned that we can translate from what's already out there. There's a lot of, um, of ways that behavior can address energy efficiency aside from residential energy use. So today I was mostly focusing on residential energy use, but there's, um, there's various ways in policy, particularly businesses, um, diffusion modeling. There's agencies that are really interested in incorporating behavioral principles in the models to make them more predictive um, training programs. So there's, a, there's um, a recent reports that came out by the CPUC and the CEC 
on action plans in California, and uh, especially in the CPUC report, they explicitly outline some ways that behavior um, should be incorporated into addressing um, climate change, and training programs is one of these. There's uh, Stanford here, in addition to the conference and the website that has a database and a bunch of other resources. Um, we're working on some research. Um, acknowledgements to people who I um, have helped with those projects up at the top, particularly Jim Sweeney, Tom Robinson, and Linda Schuck, have just been absolutely super. And just a final end note to sort of tie up the main theme of the message is that um, I think in the past, the inability to address these issues have been a design failure, and we need to not look at it as though it's a people failure, because doing that is just not going to allow us to address the problem. And that's it. So I'd be happy to take any questions. strategizing into, if the goal is to change behavior, um, upsetting a few people who are already going to be doing the behaviors probably doesn't matter that much. Um, then there's the issues of who the messenger is, and, um, and uh, there's also the issue of co-benefits. So he's creating design co-benefits that um, enable a new segment of the population to take those up. Um, there's also leadership issues, which I didn't talk about. I guess they might be fit into the policy category. I'm not sure. I have to think more about that. But I think leadership is really important and how the dynamics of um, maybe leaders feeling comfortable enough to, um, to make, take necessary leadership steps to facilitate changes is something I don't know if there's any literature on. I haven't seen it. So that's the stuff that comes to mind, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay. Uh, you focused on the end user, yep. but there are a lot of very fragmented industries mm -hmm. where there's a lot of resistance also yes. to adopting yes. efficient yep. things. Mm -hmm. Do you need different tools, or are they the same tools? I sus well, there's going to be some overlap and a bunch of differences. Um, here I've highlighted a few of the issues I think that are relevant for businesses, and I think this would make a great review paper. Um, I've tried talking to some people at the business school, but I haven't yet found anybody who I think would be relevant to taking up something like this, but maybe I'll just quickly highlight those business issues and see you know, if you have any other comments on that. So um, one issue is improving the venture process in business models um, so that green tech doesn't fail as often. Um, another is the diffusion of 
technology across within companies and across the marketplace, and I think you sort of alluded to that a little bit. Um, one is training issues, and then the third is identifying and addressing barriers within companies. So there tends to be silos within companies so that the or, um, areas of the companies that would make the energy efficiency improvements aren't necessarily the ones that are dealing with financial decisions about where to invest the money, and they tend to focus on um, getting out new products, you know, new ways of generating revenue. So, so I think there's disconnects too in how to get those different divisions communicating with one another in an effective way. So that's, that's just some brainstorming that I've done and talking to different people, but I, I think it's a really important area, um, very important, and, and I think we should move fast on that too. Yep. I had an occasion to hear about Peter Darby, who's the uh, CEO of PGE. Uh -huh. A uh, very good speaker, I recommend everybody. Uh, but he had a couple of interesting comments I'd like to get your feedback on. He had, he had said, um, of course, that changing the utility to act the way they do about efficiency wasn't easy. He, although he said uh, uh, replacing 29 or 35 top executives helped. <laughs> but he had the comment that unless state PUCs change the rules across the U.S., utilities would act the same way they, they always did, which was make more megawatts. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and he said, don't expect anything to happen unless it's happening. So to what extent is that happening elsewhere? You, know? um, you mean the decoupling? Yeah, the decoupling. Is that starting to come in? Yes, it is starting in other states. I don't remember <coughs> the stats. I know I've seen a graph on it, but I, I don't remember how many states. But I, I was my recollection is that I was surprised that a lot of states were starting to transition over. 17. 17? Oh, okay. Some people were not sure. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Yep. Uh, Carol, you had a couple of, uh, of ads from the cigarette industry, and they mm -hmm. held out an awful long time. But now they've lost mm -hmm. most. Yep. So the question is what tip? Yep. Is it carrots, sticks, information? Yep. Um, what's the metaphor? Right. So, so I think a review paper needs to be written on this too, but I, I have done a little bit of asking around, being at the School of Medicine, there are people there that specialize in cigarettes. Um, and one of the responses that I got that I thought was interesting is that um, the changes, and one of the reasons why I think the, the um, analogy might not hold in the case of climate change, but it might actually, you might have some interesting ideas, um, is that in the case of cigarettes where they really ended up getting a lot of leverage was when the public support changed so much that the government um, was able to create policies to limit cigarette companies. So the change really happened through the policy, but it was enabled by public support. And, um, but the, the way that they got the public support was, was very strategic. It was by um, creating the cigarette industry as an enemy. And it was when they got information that the cigarette companies were intentionally um, masquerading information um, that the that they used that in a lot of ads and got the public upset. So so that part of it could could be done in the case of climate change. That last part, but but then getting the um, the public so that there's an enemy and that legislation could be created against the enemy. I'm not quite, I'd be interested in what your ideas are on that because you know, a, lot of, a lot of it's gonna be changes in demand based, based on the efficiency curves I showed from McKenzie at the beginning. I think um, it's gonna be difficult to sort of just address technology or just address, um, uh, just use these very high level economic mm -hmm. incentives. I think there's gonna have to be a lot of stuff that happens at low levels with energy efficiency to really maximize reductions in energy use. Um, and, and do it in the most economical way because those are the cheapest productions that can be made. But if you have any comments on that, I'd be interested. We could talk later. Yeah. yeah. I think that the analogy between cigarettes holds up with um, coal fired electricity. If you look at sort of the parallel between um, lawsuits, investor pressure, and pressure from people's own families mm -hmm. as having been drivers with cigarettes and cigarette executives, you're seeing that play out now on Wall Street with the uh, Investors getting very nervous about uh, utilities building more coal-fired power mm -hmm. plants, and you hear the executives themselves talking about the pressure that they're under from their own families. So I, I think, at, at least in, in, in coal, there is an, an analogy with, uh, with cigarettes. Okay, so but say we take away coal, what's going to happen? Yeah. Nuclear. 
I mean, people aren't going to like nuclear either. Okay, well, we can talk. We can talk about it later. I mean, I've been looking at some stuff recently. I'd be I'd be interested in feedback. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering about retention, namely the Carter administration mm -hmm. was incredibly successful. We drove little compacts. We thought some compacts were great. We had 55 mm -hmm. mile an hour speed limits. We put on sweaters, and then somehow just evaporated. Mm -hmm. it seems to me that retention is a major issue. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think with so there's there's different types of behaviors you can change. So there's um, there's sort of one-time behaviors. So at point of purchase, or if you're retrofitting a house and you change it, and those behaviors are good because once <coughs> once you make them, you don't have to worry about them being diminished over time. For behaviors though that need to be consistent um, done consistently, I think the addressing the barriers. Um, are probably more important and that there does need to be sustained um, effort. Um, there, there's not a lot of work looking at um, that maintenance issue. Um, so some programs show really quick drop-offs. Um, other programs have looked a little bit, you know, out to maybe a few months or a year and are maintained, but then we don't really know what happens past that. I suspect that if you can do it for enough years where you make it um, individuals' habits, then that generation of individuals will continue with those practices and you, after a few years, you can probably really reduce that, the effort applied. But then you have to worry about the next generation, what's going to happen with them and if the infrastructure changes and stuff. So I think that, you know, that it's a complex issue and that needs to be studied. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have two issues I was hoping to get, I'm curious about your thoughts. Um, first one, um, in the simple model of behavior change you showed, there was a, a one box that said belief, that your belief has to change about something uh -huh. that's on the way to actually changing your actions. Uh -huh. um, so I'm wondering um, if you are, or uh, in your work, if you have thought about how values uh, are related to behavior change, uh, and this relates to ethics and epistemology. Mm -hmm. And then the second issue is, uh, I, it's my perception that in tandem with behavior change, we must also control population. Because even if we change our behavior, if there are twice as many of us, we won't get anywhere. So just okay. So the first point. Um, so yeah, I put put in values with beliefs, but something that I think I forgot to say with that diagram is that um, th that that view of changing behavior comes a little bit from assumptions about rational decision making, and that there is actually a huge amount of work now showing um, a greater integration of motivational and emotional um, um, influences on decision making. My background is actually in cognitive neuroscience and there's a ton of work on that. So, so that was really an oversimplified um, model that I did just in the interest of time and I could talk about that more if people are interested. Um, so I, I think that there's, um, that those models might even be more effective than the traditional ra rational actor model. Um, your second point about population, I think, is a really good one. Um, there is, and it, it ties in actually with the um, serial dramas that I talked about. So one of the main thrusts of the serial dramas is actually limiting population. And there's figures on this showing, you know, that if we limit population that, um, you know, CO2 reductions, how much they go down, and blah, blah, blah. And, um, really um, powerful instrument, potentially. I think and, and in the U.S., that's not necessarily the case. I mean, among populations like ours, birth rate isn't that high, but there's certain um, portions of the U.S. where um, they are having lots of kids. So it could potentially be that there's serial dramas targeting the, the, those populations. Um, the main reason, to be honest, why I don't say anything about that is because I feel like sort of the background setting that I'm working in, I, I can't focus on everything, and the background setting I'm working in, energy efficiency is much more palatable than population stuff. Did he have anything where you deal with disinformation? We were talking about cigarettes. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I, mean, I observe, I think, twist the line and mulch them in cigarettes for kids still exist. Uh -huh. oh, uh, right. Advertising for right. people out there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but in particular, given that there's certain people who are doing their best to provide disinformation yeah. on this, do you look at how you overcome that with people? Um, I think it's an important issue. I haven't personally looked at it. And there's definitely literature on this, particularly in public health. Um, 
it, there's actually some work by Huggy Rao in the business school here. He does diffusion modeling. He's very interested in counter movements. Um, and I think that there, um, there are places in climate change, especially with the messaging, like clearly the stuff Steve works with. I mean, that must be a constant battle that you have to You can't decouple it from the media. Mm -hmm. They have to just decide not to give equal weight to positions that don't carry equal weight. Mm -hmm. I think we should probably uh, cut it off just there uh, because we have another group coming in here at 5.15. So let's thank Carrie once again. Uh, today is one of the days that there will be an energy social at the faculty club, except for those who are members of the Woods Energy Committee who have a meeting right now just here. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.